Welcome to Our Community. Susie Thomas with you this morning. We are visiting with Keith Hohottle from ComQuest. Good morning. Good morning, Susie. So always good to see you because you are really the one that rolls up his sleeves and you are down in the trenches and taking care of the, the problem that many of us are just realizing is a problem now, yeah. do you say? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that, that our, our community has has kind of moved towards some solutions. And, and one of the beauties of Stark County is that um, whether it's been the fatal opiate overdoses, whether it's been the <clears throat> suicides that have occurred in the schools, whatever that is, our community moves towards solutions, and and ComQuest has been, you know, part of that part of that solution in in both cases. You know, we've we've uh, invested some time and resources and staff to to create solutions for the opiate stuff. Um, been asked to respond, as have other organizations, to the to some of the the suicide issues that we have in our community. So, we've been we've been on the front line. I've seen it tied where, uh, let's talk about the teen suicides, where they've been tied to bullying, where they've been tied to broken hearts. But I have not seen, uh, are they tied to the opiate crisis as well? Are these two things connected? I, I think there's a tie into substance use or at least at mm, risk for substance yes. use. I'm, I'm not so sure that it's directly tied to the opiate stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that now with the CDC coming in and the health department being uh, continuing to be more involved, I think we're going to get a little bit more data that kind of makes some attempt to, to tie all of these at least together a little bit. The the folks that came in from New Jersey, the postvention folks that came in that Stark Marr um, had in, they gave some really good input. Um, the program that, uh, that was out at RG Drag a few Fridays ago that yes. talked about the business community and that was a really good, vital piece of information as well. So I think we're, we're again, anytime we have an opportunity to reduce the stigma and be able to talk about stuff, we have a better chance to succeed or to at least make a dent in, in some sort of issue that we have in our community. I'm hoping because it's now top of the mind. It's mm-hmm. absolutely on people's minds because Stark County has gotten pretty dismal ratings, rankings as far as you don't want to be number one in opioid crisis. But no. uh, we're, that's where we find ourselves among the worst in the country. How is that possible? Well, I think we found ourselves at the, you know, when we looked at the infant mortality stuff, we were exactly we were the last county in the bottom of the state and the last state in the union. In, exactly. In that. So, um you know, it's it, it's interesting. While Ohio itself has has continued to have increases in our fatal overdoses, so we were up, I think, thirty nine percent was the last number I saw. Stark County's been down a little bit, and again, I think it's Good. been down because one, people are willing to get help. Second of all, we have Narcan in all of our first responders' hands, and and the, the you know this week or a, April 9th, I think is is um, first responders' week. Um, Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we let them know how much we appreciate the great work that they do as well. Um, And and again, I I think that that we've created additional treatment beds, treatment options, the courts, the schools, the the faith-based community. Everybody's kind of come together to work for a solution. And, you know... What's all tied into the to the suicide stuff? I think we're going to find out as time goes on. Yes, I'm going to say something I may regret, and then you tell me where I'm wrong here. We try not to step on people's toes. So when you see things like fatherlessness, when you see things that uh, prayer taken out of schools, when you see certain things, and the faith community warns. There's going to be some bad outcomes from this, and people come back saying, don't tell me how to live my life. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me what to believe. Are we now seeing those bad outcomes? Is this what, are we eating the fruits of all of that, mm-hmm. or what's your perspective? So I think my perspective is, that, you know, we know there are risk factors, whether it's teen suicide, whether it's substance use issues, and, and, I, th- and I think we all know what those risk factors are. And when we take some of the protective factors away, Mm -hmm. whether it's prayer, whether it's, you know, 
how folks parent. Um, the message I gave at my church a couple Sundays ago was, you know, it's okay to reach into your kid's social media account and see what's going on in there. Heavens, um, yes. I, I, I <laughs> was reminded of a story a number of years ago when I was when I was working in adolescent treatment, and there was a there was a young man in there, and he was just really upset that his parents had gone into his bedroom and gone up into his drop ceiling and he says they invaded my empire and one of the other kids asked him he says so I'd like to see your checkbook and see where you were writing the checks for the house Mm -hmm. or paying your cell phone Mm -hmm. bill Um, it's mom and dad's ceiling you know I I I think that I think that that's a really hard subject to to broach with our kids sometimes, but we need to be able to have that conversation with them. We need to we need to we need to be looking and seeing what they're what they're investing their time in mm-hmm. well, as par- well. Parenting is not for sissies for no, sure. No, it's not. Um, nope. And and the point is to give them more and more and more autonomy and responsibility, but that's got to be earned, right? That with right. trust. Right, right, and and I think that. You know, if you if you look at all of all of the events that have occurred, whether it's an overdose, whether it's the the suicide stuff, I th- I think that what we find in a number of cases, if we walk into our kids' world, into their social media world, or into the world of those folks who who are using substances and things like that, we'll see some paths that got them there. We may not see the clear path that ended up resulting in where it did but we'll see that path and and so I, I and in those phones and those things hold hold a key a number of years ago um, I asked a gentleman I said please take out every phone number in your phone that has to do with using or enabling and he says oh I'll still have I said, how many mm-hmm. phone numbers do you think you have left he said, oh, I'll still have quite a few so he began one by one taking them out, and the only number he had left was his 10-year-old son. Oh, my. So he said to me, he says, I never realized how much of my life had to do with using or enabling until I started to take out all of my contacts. Wow. Including his mom, who would give him money, knowing full well that he was probably going to buy something. On the enabling part mm-hmm. of it. Yep. My goodness. I think one of the most heartbreaking things was when there are no telltale signs. One of the families who lost a child put in the obituary what you're suggesting. They, we did not see this coming. Mm-hmm. And hug your children yep. and tell them you love them. And and for the family who was doing that and still saw this kind of a thing, what are flags? What are patterns that parents should be aware of that might tell them that their child is either um, dependent on some kind of a chemical or is having dark, going to dark, dark places in their minds. So I, so I read something when we were in the middle of all this suicide stuff that uh, if, if kids spend five or more hours on social media a day, they're 70 percent more likely to come across something that either talks about or, or kind of precipitates some suicide mm. thoughts. Um, and I only have five to, hours a day. That's how how is that? That'd be up all night, right? No, that'd be from four o'clock when they get home from school till uh, oh, till nine o'clock at I night. I see, including through dinner. Wow. Okay. When you or put it that in the way, morning when they get up, yeah, or you know the hour then and the yeah. hour when they're in school and and that. So it's really not. It's really not because that sounds that a many. lot. It does sound like a lot. <laughs> I think the other thing is I was walking past my my 9-year-old daughter's bedroom the other day and I heard something in the music she was listening to. I said, "What was that?" And all of a sudden she turned it down instead of answering me. Ooh. Um so, you know, because I'm the investigative dad kind of guy, I went in and I said, "So show me what you're <laughs> listening to." Mm-hmm. And, you know, she showed me, and I looked up the lyrics, and I said, "This is why you can't listen to this ever again." Right. Um, so it's things like that. It's it's you know when we ask our kids, "Hey, sit down, and talk to me, have a conversation yeah. with me, let me know what's going on." You know when their when their friends change. You know we're used to them hanging out and bringing people over, and when they start to go someplace else, or they have a different change in friends, sometimes that has to do with it. When they're closed you know, how they dress changes when, when they, they interrupt some of those activities that they've, they've always been doing for a long time. Um, things like that indicate change. Um, when they just, when they're what we would call a sad or depressed mood more often than not, that's, that's a, a, a red flag. And a lot of these things are just, 
you know, we'd say, oh, they're just being a teenager. Right. Some of that is adolescence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So we just have to, you know, be responsible parents and dig a little deeper. So know your child so that you can know when your child is not acting like your child. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. All right. In a in a nutshell. Yep. Uh, you've got so many great things coming on and happening around our community. Let's go out to Alliance. Uh, that's still Stark County. What's sure. The, what's happening there? So in Alliance, at the uh, very, very end of October, we opened up the uh, Alliance Detox and Recovery Unit inside Alliance Hospital. So we had been looking to uh, to to meet a need for detox for alcohol, opiates, and benzodiazepines like Xanax, Valium, stuff like that. Um, not that the crisis center wasn't doing a good job, but oftentimes it was full. And uh, had been over talking to uh, Mr. Jonas at Alliance Hospital about a couple other things. And he said, hey, I have some space I'd like to rent. And we said, hey, we're looking for some detox, inpatient detox. So what we've done is, is created an inpatient detox unit there for, for alcoholism, for opiate use disorders, for benzodiazepines. Um, we're doing a little bit of short-term work around cocaine, methamphetamines, and mm-hmm. amphetamines. Um, it's in the hospital, so one, we get that, that part where they can come in either through the emergency room or where they can uh, just call directly and, and have a direct admit. But what we found is that um, because it's in a hospital, um, people are a little bit more comfortable saying, hey, I'm going to the hospital for a few days. Yes. As opposed to I'm going to detox for a few days. Smart. Um, 16 beds, um, been uh, been pretty successful so far. Um, so the first month we averaged probably about five or six folks in there and then in, uh, in February, we were about 12, and this month so far, we're close to 14. So That, that really is such a brilliant idea. Does it take place in other hospitals as well? Is there, are there plans to have centers like this in other hospitals? So Mercy used to have a program called the IMPACT program, mm-hmm. and then folks would continue that, that care through their, through their outpatient services. So it looks a lot like what theirs used to. Um, Columbus at, at Ohio State has, uh, has their facility um, so there are a few like it. Um, we kind of like the fact that we can keep people in a full continuum of care. So if they need to go from detox to residential care, mm-hmm. we can do that. We have it tied to our opiate treatment programs. So I think that what makes our program different is just the full scope of, of services, um, including the mental health and psychiatric services. So I think that's what sets it apart of other folks. So um, we recognize that it would be a regional project. So uh, much like our Maslin Regional Center for Opiate Recovery that I think has touched about 26 counties now. Wow. Um, we've touched about six counties so far with the uh, with the detox center. So we're kind of looking forward to <clears throat> continuing it. The other thing that's different about it is we're not limited to three days. So if somebody needs to stay a couple weeks or something like that, they can stay for a couple weeks while we're waiting for them to get a bed someplace. Right there in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. It's just wonderful. Um, are doctors prescribing these less? It seems like there's a cutback because I think they felt so, certain amount of responsibility for people becoming hooked on them when they were trying to just use them for pain management. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we are seeing. I think we are seeing mm-hmm. less. Mm-hmm. Um, we're seeing a lot of doctors now prescribing Suboxone. Some for good reason. Some that are a little challenging for those of us who are treatment providers as well. Um, but I do think that, that doctors are prescribing less. They're prov- prescribing less quantities. So where maybe before it was 30 days, maybe now it's 10 days or mm-hmm. seven days and mm-hmm. saying, hey, look, this is really all you need. And their awareness of of those folks who are drug seeking has increased as well. And and frankly, the medical community has, has been one of those one of those supporters of both treatment and the need to change things. Yes. You know, they... they take a lot of heat for for some of their prescribing habits but you know there are also a number of drug manufacturers that were saying hey you know what this is a this is a great safe opiate product exactly and what we're finding is that's not all that true after all right uh, and and you get the pen and you get the you know the little stress ball and all that with the name oh, of yeah. it on it and yeah all the little things they leave behind and get a hat and you yeah. get a little mm-hmm. yeah, knapsack and things like <laughs> oh yeah right. yeah all yep. of those things that's what yep. they do yeah mm-hmm. that's how it works um, we are speaking with Keith Hohottle. he's from ComQuest going to take a short break we'll be back after these words you're listening to our community <laughs> 